shall we all rise? shall be seasons refreshing sent from the Savior above showers of blessings showers of blessings we need mercies drops round us are falling showers we plead there shall be showers of blessings precious reviving again over the hills and the valleys sound of abundance of rain Showers of blessings, showers of blessings we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead, there shall be showers of blessings. Send them upon. the p 
There's no one, there's no one like him. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like Come on, let's sing it. Sing together. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. Yes, Lord. There's no one, there's no one like him. Nobody like him. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's nobody like him. There's no one, there's no one like him. I walk, I walk. I walk, I walk, I no one, 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 no one,
Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. Indeed, you are highly lifted up and your train fills the temple. This evening, this service, O oh God, is unto you. Our worship, our praise, and the word we receive, O oh God, is coming to change our lives, to put us on another level in you. Therefore, I'm asking that your presence indeed will guard and guide our minds and our hearts as we receive your word. May there be changes in our lives. We give you praise and we give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated.
Welcome to the Ottawa branch of All Nations Full Gospel Church. Nous sommes heureux de vous accueillir ici. On behalf of our senior pastors, Professor Samuel and Dr. Rose Donko, and our resident pastor, Dr. Veronica Adoubouvier, nous vous souhaitons la bienvenue à ce culte. Notre pasteur assistant, Pastor Malungu, our Connect pastors, Chike and Gucci Agbasi, and our ANFGC Good Life Minister, Elena, welcome you warmly to the Ottawa branch. 2024 is the year of double portion, and our anchor scripture is Isaiah 61, verse 7. In 2024, God has singled you out for a breakthrough. 2024 est l'année de la double portion, et notre passage de référence est Isaiah 61, verset 7. En 2024, Dieu t'a distingué pour une percée. Our weekly services are as follows. Join us every Friday from 9 to 11 p.m. as we press in in prayer. It's time to go deeper. Voici nos cultes hebdomadaires. Rejoignez-nous chaque vendredi de 21h à 23h alors que nous avançons dans la prière. C'est le moment d'aller encore plus profond. Let us connect every morning, Monday to Friday, from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. for a powerful time of prayer using the ID and the passcode on the screen. Connectons-nous chaque matin, du lundi au vendredi, de 6h à 7h, pour un moment puissant dans la prière, en utilisant l'identifiant et le mot de passe affiché à l'écran. Here are today's announcements. Voici les annonces du jour. April is the month of living your purpose. And one of our anchor scriptures is Ephesians 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. Le mois d'avril a pour thème, vivre dans sa destinée, et l'un de nos passages de référence est Ephésiens 2, verset 10. Car nous sommes son ouvrage, ayant été créé en Jésus-Christ pour de bonnes œuvres que Dieu a préparées d'avance afin que nous les pratiquions. Our 2024 Leaders Installation Service will take place tonight at 6.30 p.m. All leaders are required to attend and everyone is encouraged to participate. Let us expect a great move from God. Notre culte d'installation des leaders aura lieu ce soir à 18h30. Tous les leaders sont demandés à être présents et tout le monde est encouragé à participer. Attendons-nous à un puissant mouvement de Dieu. Our church is growing. Our sister Daisy Fernandez and our brother David Wedraogo were blessed with the baby boy Melchizedek Mateo on April 5th. Please use the phone numbers on the screen to congratulate them. Notre église grandit. Notre sœur Desi Fernandez et notre frère David Wedraogo ont été bénis par un petit garçon Melchizedek Mateo le 5 avril 2024. Veuillez utiliser le numéro affiché à l'écran pour les féliciter. Our very own minister Elena Mino is hosting a free community event called RAFA on April 20th at 5.30 p.m. Let's come for a night of worship and dance. Notre chère Elena Mino organise un événement communautaire gratuit appelé RAFA et ce, le 20 avril à 17h30. Venons tous ensemble pour une nuit d'adoration et de danse. Meditate on the Word of God with Singer Pastor. Last Sunday, Professor Donko announced that he plans to begin meditating on the Word of God using the method he taught us during the Leaders Retreat. To prepare for this, kindly scan the QR code on the screen to fill out the form. Please note that those who signed up last week will need to resubmit their names through the form. Méditez sur la parole de Dieu avec le pasteur principal. Dimanche dernier, le pasteur Donko a annoncé qu'il planifie le début de la méditation 
Utilisons la méthode enseignée pendant la retraite des leaders. Pour vous préparer, veuillez scanner le code QR affiché à l'écran afin de remplir le formulaire. Notez que ceux qui sont inscrits la semaine dernière doivent soumettre leur nom par le formulaire. This year, our annual Anida Day will take place on April 28. It is a day dedicated to raise awareness and funds for our global communities. Join us as we celebrate the ongoing work of Anida. Cette année, la journée annuelle d'Anida se tiendra le 28 avril. C'est un jour dédié à sensibiliser et recueillir des fonds pour nos communautés à l'échelle globale. Rejoignez-nous pour célébrer le travail continu d'Anida. Here are our upcoming events. Voici nos événements à venir. Is this your first time worshiping with us? We welcome you and we're glad to have you. If you're joining us online, can you submit your contact form? Est-ce votre première fois d'adorer avec nous? Nous vous accueillons et sommes heureux de vous avoir. Si vous êtes en ligne, veuillez soumettre votre formulaire de contact. For current and future updates, please follow our Facebook, Instagram and TikTok platforms. Pour nos annonces actuelles et futures, Veuillez nous suivre sur nos plateformes Facebook, Instagram et TikTok. Thank you for your attention. And today's topic, God's Covenant People. If you recall, in our last lesson, we saw that God entered into covenant relations with Abraham to preserve upon the earth the revelation of himself which he had given to man. And is the reason he entered into that covenant with Abraham. And Abraham and his descendants were to be God's covenant people on earth. So if you look at Genesis 17, verse 7, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. And so it is obvious that the covenant God cut with Abraham was also between him and his descendants. It was meant to be an everlasting covenant so that he would be God to them and their descendants after them. So throughout the entire world, the only group of people that had a relationship with God was the people of Abraham. Everybody else was outside the covenant of God. And uh, through this covenant people, God was going to send the Redeemer. So it wasn't like God forgot about everyone else and just picked his favorites. That wasn't the case. But he picked, he had to work through someone so that the Redeemer could come. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son so that through him all of us would be saved. So that was God's intention. That was God's purpose. If you look at Genesis 22, 17 and 18, Blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of the enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth 
shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So the people who were brought into covenant relationship with God were also to be his testimony upon the earth. So people could see them and know the difference between the true and living God and all the man-made gods the nations worshipped. And if you study the geography of the world, Palestine was located geographically so that the ancient civilizations had to pass through it in their commercial relations with each other until the Suez Canal was died. There was a link, a land link between Africa, the Middle East, the, and Asia, Europe. And so they were strategically located. So as the nations interacted with each other commercially, going to Africa, buying things and bringing them to the other parts of the world, you had to go through Palestine. And by so doing, you notice a nation that was so distinct, a nation so blessed, a nation God had elevated with laws that brought liberty and freedom to people as opposed to the dictatorship that was all around them. So governance, God's covenant people were to be a witness to them of the revelation of the true and living God. And so now let's, as we continue in our studies, let's look at number one, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Please say with me, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. The book of Genesis gives us the history of Abraham and his immediate descendants. Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. The book of Genesis may be grouped around five names. Adam. The first five chapters, one to five, talks about Adam. And then as you progress, chapter six through to 11, talk about Noah. And then Abraham, chapters 12 to 26. Then Jacob, chapters 27 through to 37. And Joseph, chapters 38 to 45. And, and so the book of Genesis gives us a history of Adam, Abraham, and then you can, and then the rest of the people. Adam, as a matter of fact, Adam, Noah, Abraham, Jacob, and Joseph. So a brief summary of the character of these descendants of Abraham in the blood covenant. We need to look at it from that standpoint. And uh, so, A, let's look at Isaac. The, the most beautiful of the Old Testament characters. If you look at Isaac, he was a gentle person so gentle, quiet, he had a quiet spirit. And uh, he has left an impression upon Jewish life that no other of the fathers ever gave. 
His marriage was so beautiful. And his love for Rebecca is one of the loveliest of the stories of the founders of that wonderful people. I was so inspired by Isaac's marriage to Rebecca that I used to say to myself, if my dad were born again, if my dad knew Christ, tongue talking, I would have asked him to look for a girl for me. I used to say that because I loved that story. It made a great impact on me. And then Jacob. Jacob is another character. Crooked, selfish, and shrewd. It is doubtful that he ever made anyone happy. If you dealt with him, he was going to screw you. He was so shrewd. And um, it is so doubtful that he made anyone happy. But this man met God at Jabbok. And God laid his mighty hand upon him. From that day, Jacob became a different man. Jacob became so different, so transformed. And he had power with God and man. An amazing story. An incredible story. A man who wrestled with God. A man who was so determined despite the pain. Said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. His life proves that God can change the most crooked lives and make them straight. Then let's look at Joseph. Joseph is our prince. So beautiful. Nowhere in literature is there anything to compare with this young boy who became a wonderful man, a wonderful statesman, a wonderful founder and preserver of a nation. In fact, not just the nation of Israel, but also the nations of the world at that time, Egypt in particular, He's just an incredible person. The fragrance of his life lingers upon the ages of Israel's history. At the age of 17, he was sold as a slave into Egypt by his own brothers who were jealous of him because he exhibited a gift that all of them were jealous of. First, about his earthly possessions and then about the gift that God gave him. So if you look at Genesis 37, 25 to 28, and they sat down to eat a meal, then they lifted their eyes and looked and there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels, bearing spices, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry them down to Egypt. So Judah said to his brothers, what profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him for he is our brother in our flesh. And his brothers listened. Then Midianites traders passed by. 
So the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver and they took Joseph to Egypt. And uh, as far as they were concerned, this was somebody they had gotten rid of. They didn't know that Satan was using them to destroy the bloodline. If you've been part of our series, when Adam and Eve sinned and became slaves and servants to the devil, they had broken the fellowship they had with God. And, and consequently, man could not have salvation without divine intervention. So God in his mercy promised that the seed of the woman will destroy, will bruise the head of the serpent and bring salvation. So Satan went to work to try to make sure that that Redeemer would not be able to come. So because God gave a general promise, he didn't know the one who was going to be the source through whom the Redeemer will come. So initially, Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain, who gave his heart and mind to Satan. So, Satan filled his heart and his brother Abel who was the righteous one. So through him God was going to work in order to bring the Redeemer. So Satan filled the heart of Cain to destroy him. He murdered him. Cain murdered his brother over an offering. They decided to offer offerings to God and God was pleased with the offering of Abel and blessed him. And he became so jealous that he murdered him. So Satan thought he had succeeded. But then God opened the womb of Eve again and Eve gave birth to Seth to replace Abel. So through him came that righteous line and Noah. It got to a point where the whole earth, Satan tried to take the knowledge of God out of the world. So everybody became belligerent to the things of God. No one knew God except Noah. So it was imperative that God bring a, fr a flood to destroy everybody in order to save the righteous line. So Noah became that person. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And God preserved him and his family. And they populated the earth. And, and through that came again they rebelled. They knew the word of God. The word of God said, the command of God said, they should replenish the earth, they should populate it. But they didn't want to go. They wanted to stay together. They didn't want to honor the word of God. They didn't want to save him. And again, Satan had succeeded in making man turn his back on God. And so came the Tower of Babel and God stepped in and as a result distributed people across the globe. And, and so people started with the knowledge of God in every culture. But you know what happened? Again, people started 
worshipping idols. And by the time of Abraham, everybody was worshipping idols all over the world. And then, but God touched the heart of Abraham, who would not bow to idols, even in his own father's house. So God called him out of that place to work with him and to build a nation. And God cut a covenant with him. And so we see the progression here. And, um, and so we've come to the place where God cut a covenant with Abraham. And Abraham, you see, when God, you see, God is a covenant making and a covenant keeping God. He will not break his covenant. And the blood covenant was such that it could not be dissolved. Once it was cut, it stayed intact forever. And so God was working through a righteous line to bring about the Savior and to build a nation as he promised Abraham, his friend. And so um, at 30 years of age, do you know that this young man, Joseph, became the ruler of Egypt? Even though his brothers thought that they had finished with him, they would never see him again. He would amount to nothing because he was a slave. He was someone's property. And that tells you that if God has given you a word, if God has given you a promise, regardless of how hard the enemy may try, he will not be able to cut short that promise. It will come to fruition. It will be fulfilled in your life. And so if you look at Genesis 41, 37 to 45, so the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one de as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne I will be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all, all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand, and he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And he had him ride in the second chariot, which he had. And they cried out before him, Bow the knee. So he set him over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no man may lift his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zanaf Panir, and he gave him as a wife, Asenaf, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. So Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. Hallelujah. Satan worked over time to destroy the righteous seed. Genesis 46, 1 to 26. So Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. Then God spoke to Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. So he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make of you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will 
also surely bring you up again. And Joseph will put his hand on your eyes. Then Jacob arose from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried their father Jacob, their little ones and their wives, in the carts which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. So they took their livestock and their goods, which they had acquired in the land of Canaan, and went to Egypt, Jacob and all his descendants with him his sons and his sons' sons, his daughters and his sons' daughters, and all his descendants he brought with him to Egypt. Now these were the names of the children of Israel, Jacob and his sons who went to Egypt. Reuben was Jacob's firstborn. The sons of Reuben were Hanok, Palu, Hezron, and Kermai. The sons of Simeon were Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jachin, Zohar, and Shaul, the sons of the Canaanite woman. The sons of Levi were Geshem, Kohath, and Merari. The sons of Judah were Er, Onan, Shelah, Perez, and Zerah. But Er and Onan died in the land of Canaan. The sons of Perez were Hezron and Hamul. The sons of Issachar were Tola, Puva, Job, and Shimron. The sons of Zebulon were Sered, Elon, and Jaleel. These were the sons of Leah, whom she bore to Jacob in Padan Aram with his daughter Dinah, all the persons, his sons, and his daughters were 33. The sons of God were Ziphion, Haggai, Shuni, Esbon, Erai, Arodi, and Arali. The sons of Asher were Jimna, Ishua, Isu, Beriah, and Sarah, their sister, and the sons of Beriah were Heber and Micaiah. These were the sons of Zelpa, whom Laban gave to Leah, his daughter, and these she bore to Jacob's sixteen persons. The sons of Rachel, Jacob's wife, were Joseph and Benjamin. And to Joseph in the land of Egypt were born Manasseh and Ephraim, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bore to him. The sons of Benjamin were Bela, Becca, Ashbel, Gera, Naaman, Eha, Rosh, Mupim, Hupim, and Ad. These were the sons of Rachel, who were born to Jacob, fourteen persons in all. The sons of Dan was Hushim, the son. The sons of Naphtali were Jaziel, Guni, Jeza, and Shalem. These were the sons of Bela, whom Laban gave to Rachel, his daughter, and she bore these to Jacob, seven persons in all. All the persons who went with Jacob to Egypt, who came from his body, besides Jacob's sons' wives, were 66 persons in all. Hallelujah. So in total, 70 souls. Number two, reason for going to Egypt. See, the covenant keeping, the, gov the covenant keeping God, remembered his promise to Abraham that he would make of him a great nation to save his covenant people from destruction during the famine that was sweeping the land of Canaan. The covenant God brought them into Egypt there to thrive and multiply. So let's look at Genesis 45, 6 and 7. For these two years, the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. So God used Jacob to preserve his people. He overruled the work of Satan. 
It was Satan who had brought that farming to destroy humanity. He was after the, the, uh, the righteous line. Remember, at first God said, the seed of the woman, but when, call, when God called Abraham and said to Abraham, then he knew that this is the family to target. And because the deliverer, the redeemer, will come through them. And so he targeted them and he brought this famine to wipe them off. And But God had already put in motion his own way of preserving that nation because of his covenant with Abraham. So God used Joseph to preserve his people. And one of the things that I try to remind people, when God blesses you, when he raises you up, you must understand why. Sometimes we may think, look at what people have done to me. I will not talk to anyone. I will not work with anyone. I will just keep to myself. But Joseph understood the purpose. Why God saved him. Why God promoted him. Why God gave him that gift to preserve his people. Because if you look at verse 8, at, so now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. What a picture it gives to us of the faithfulness and loving care of the God who said when he entered into the blood covenant of Abraham, by myself I have sworn. He knows the end from the beginning. He knew Satan was at work. Satan wanted to destroy Abraham's seed. And, and so he prepared this man. And Satan was at work. They wanted to kill him. God intervened through one of his brothers. They, so they changed the plan and dumped him in, in a pit. And one of them said, why don't we sell him instead? And as far as they were concerned, he was sold into slavery and he would never amount to anything and the vision would be lost. And, and Satan did a victory lap. Uh, for, I mean, he rejoiced. The children of Israel, but he did not know God was going to use him to cause the children of Israel to thrive. So they thrived. They were favored settlers. When they went to Egypt, they were not given the most um, hostile part of the land, but actually the best part of the land. All of these things were bestowed upon, upon them. And if you look at Genesis 47, 1 to 12, and then we jump to verse 27, then Joseph went and told Pharaoh, and said, my father and my brothers, their flocks and their herds, and all that they possess have come from the land of Canaan. And indeed, they are in the land of Goshen. And he took five men from among his brothers and presented them to Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh said to his brothers, what is your occupation? And he said to Pharaoh, your servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. And they said to Pharaoh, we have come to dwell in the land because your servants have no pasture for their flocks, for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. Now therefore, please let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. 
Then Pharaoh spoke to Joseph, saying, Your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Have your father and, and brothers dwell in the best of the land. Let them dwell in the land of Goshen. And if you know any competent men among them, then make them chief headsmen over my livestock. Then Joseph brought in his father Jacob and set him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Jacob, How old are you? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. And they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my father in the days of their pilgrimage. So Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from before Pharaoh. And Joseph situated his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses. And Pharaoh had commanded, as Pharaoh had commanded. Then Joseph provided his father, his brothers, and all his father's household with bread according to the number in their families. Hallelujah. So Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen, and they had possessions there and grew and multiplied exceedingly. Above all, the favor of God was upon them. He was keeping his covenant with Abraham. And the word that he spoke, saying that his seed shall be a multitude as the stars of heaven and as the sand upon the seashore, he wouldn't allow the enemy to destroy it because he's a covenant making and a covenant keeping God. So they increased marvelously. God was making of them a great nation which would be his witness upon the earth. If you look at Exodus 1 verse 7, but the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. In the 210 years that the children of Israel were in Egypt, their number increased from 70 to over 3 million. The chronology shows that 210 years were spent in Egypt. And if you may think, what is this? Since the Bible says they were there for 430 years. But if you look at Exodus 12, 40, in the Septuagint, and the, um, and the sojourning of the children of Israel, while they sojourned in the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan, 430 years. So this passage brings it out in the Septuagint better. That means the sojourning of the children of Israel while they sojourned in the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan. So you can see that the total number of years, both in the land of Canaan and in the land of Egypt, was 430 years. Do you see it? And if you look at uh, Galatians 3, 16 and 17, now to Abraham and his seed where the promise is made, he does not say, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. And this I say, that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul 
the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ that he should make the promise of no effect. And so this passage also throws more light on it as showing the period began to be reckoned from the date of the promise to Abraham. You see it? To the deliverance of the children, which makes precisely 430 years. So between the entering of Canaan and the birth of Isaac was 25 years. From the birth of Isaac until the birth of Jacob, there were 60 years. Jacob was 130 years old when he entered Egypt. This whole interval amounts to 220 years. So if you add 210 years to this number, makes precisely 430 years. So the 430 years of sojourning from Abraham to the deliverance from Egypt. Is that clear? So let's look at point number three, the persecution of God's covenant people. And so Satan has been working over time to make sure that no one serves God but him. So he tried to, to take the knowledge of God Almighty from among humanity. But God has always kept a righteous line, a righteous race. And finally, when he promised uh, that, when he called Abraham, he said, I'm going to work with you so that the Messiah will come. And so Satan has always hated God's covenant people. We saw in the last mm -hmm. lesson the working of Satan to destroy the seed of the woman through whom the promised Redeemer was to come. Now that the Redeemer has been specified as the seed of Abraham, Satan seeks to destroy God's covenant people. Satan doesn't like it. After a period of 100 years in Egypt, during which the Israelites had grown into a mighty people, Satan seeks to destroy them. And how does he go about it? He puts fear into the hearts of the leaders of Egypt. And an ill-grounded fear that the Israelites who were so mighty in number would join themselves to the enemies of the Egyptians in time of war. So this was something they imagined and projected on them. And it became the basis of their hatred and subjugation of God's covenant people. You notice Satan always uses the mind. He creates imaginary things and he throws them in your mind. And if you do not put your foot down to say, no, I refuse to think this way. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So you can see here that Satan is hard at work to persecute God's covenant people. So if you look at Exodus 1, 8 to 10, now there arose a new king of Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And it happened in the event of war that they also join our enemies and fight against us and so go up out of the land. So a new leader comes who wasn't well educated and loved power 
and maybe drugs and everything that um, was available. And so fear filled his heart. He wanted to subjugate them. He, he, he was just afraid of them. He said, they are more than us. They are mightier than us. Remember, Jacob went there, and if you add Joseph and his family, they were just 70 people. How could they multiply more than them? That shows you that God was at work. He said, I will make you a mighty nation. And God was at work. And so when that fear materialized in the heart of Pharaoh and he transferred it onto his, his cabinet and his leadership, then they followed counsels of systematic oppression and enslavement, determined tyranny and cruelty. They became so evil it wasn't funny. If you look at verses 10 to 14, come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And it happened in the event of war that they also join our enemies and fight against us and so go up out of the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were in dread of the children of Israel. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve of rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and brick and in all manner of service in the field, all their service in which they made themselves was with rigor. And so, the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied. They became so cruel to them. They will whip them. They will press them. They laid burdens on them that caused them to cry unto God every night. And sometimes when the enemy is doing these things, it drives us closer to our God. And in his mind, he wants to subjugate, he wants to suppress, he wants to uh, prove that he is in charge, but that is one thing that usually happens. People cry unto their God. People serve God. If you're going through any, any situation, it's time to seek the face of the Lord. And, and because of that, the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And if you look at verses 15 to 22, then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one was Shifra and the name of the other Pua. And he said, when you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew woman and see them on the birth stools, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. But if it's a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives fear God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and saved the male children alive? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. Therefore, God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very mighty. And so it was, 
because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them. So Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. Hallelujah. So you can see the mutilations. You can see the torture, the cruelty. Worst of all, the command that every son be killed or cast into the river. You can see the handiwork of Satan, the handprint of Satan. This is the work of the enemy. He is the one behind this because he's persecuting the covenant people, the covenant people of God. He wants to destroy. He wants to kill them. And but they cry to God and he heard them. The covenant keeping God comes down to deliver his people from their bondage. If you look at Exodus 2, 23 to 35, and then we jump to Exodus 3, 5 to 8. Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage and they cried out and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel and God acknowledged them. Then he said, do not Draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Havites and the Jebusites. When God makes a covenant with you, he will always fulfill his part. Regardless of how hard the enemy tries, he cannot succeed and he will not succeed. But there's something about hardship and trials. They draw us closer to God. If we don't allow it to crush us and pull us away from God, and so if you study in the second chapter of Exodus, it talks about the birth of Moses and his life until the time of his call. And then we notice two facts here. The hiding of the baby Moses at the river's bank by his mother. And Moses later renunciation of Egypt were not rash acts. Sometimes it's very, it's one of the things I think about. The boldness. Everybody else will give birth to a baby boy and will gladly surrender no attempt to hide them. But here comes a couple, a family, regardless of the, of the consequences. They were not going to deliver their son, Moses. You can see the mighty hand of God at work. Because it wasn't, 
Why, why do you think everybody gladly handed over? I use the word gladly, but they were not doing so gladly. They did it out of compulsion, out of fear. But here comes a family that despite the same atrocities being meted out to those who defy the laws of Pharaoh, suffered. They were prepared to suffer those consequences rather than give up their son. Those were not. And then, of course, when Moses grew up, renounced his citizenship as an Egyptian because he would rather identify with the people of God. Many a time, when I look at how people please so much emphasis. I live here, I got to go here. I, I said, do they understand that the Lord is making a city for us, a place that no man is building but God himself. And that must be our driving force. Not any, I can live anywhere and enjoy God as long as I'm in his perfect will. And so you can see here the hiding of the baby Moses at the river's bank by his mother and Moses later renouncing his citizenship of Egypt were not rash acts because if you look at Hebrews 11, 23 to 27 by faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents. Three months. Because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid. You, you see the word afraid? Fear is what drives us to do things that we know to be wrong. Or uh, we're not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the sons of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Christ, in Egypt rather. For, the, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Hallelujah. So the passage shows that both acts were based upon faith in the covenant keeping God. I just want you to think about it. They, they believed in God. For some strange reason, that family believed in God. And he caused their son also to believe in God. That he would rather suffer affliction in order to save the living God than to be in the palace and bow to man and bow to idols. The third and fourth chapters of Exodus give to us the call of Moses, including the story of the burning bush, the revelation of God to him and his plans for delivering the Israelites, Moses' hesitancy to respond and the permission for Aaron to accompany him. Every time I think about it, in scripture you see that whenever God is sending forth someone, he sends them in pairs. He will call you individually, but he will give you a helper. Unfortunately, many people think that playing the second fiddle is inferior. No, it's a calling. 
It's a calling. Do you know that eventually God exalted Aaron and gave him an everlasting priesthood? He didn't give it to Moses. He gave it to Aaron because he played the second fiddle well. Jesus says, if you are faithful in that which is another man's, then you will get your own riches. But if you are not faithful in that which belongs to someone else, you will never get your own. And so in ministry, let us commit. Let's be faithful. Let's be loyal to the end. And so you, we see this beautiful, wonderful thing here. We notice the power given to Moses. God gave him a rod whereby he might perform miracles. We also notice that God manifested himself to Moses not only as a covenant-keeping God, but also as a miracle-working God. If you look at Exodus 4, 20 to 26, then Moses took his wife and his sons and set them on a donkey and returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in your hand. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you say to Pharaoh, then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, let my son go, that he may save me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed I will kill you. I will kill your son, your firstborn. And it came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Then Zephyrah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of his son and cast it at Moses' feet and said, Surely you are a husband of blood to me. So he let him go. Then she said, You are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. This reveals the important place that the blood covenant held. It wasn't something God did with Abraham alone, but he said with his descendants. And he also said, anyone who does not circumcise is cut off from his covenant. And Moses is the one now at the forefront of the covenant to bring a deliverance and he was violating the blood covenant. And so you notice God wanted to kill him. He wanted to kill him. There is something about the covenant of God. He does not play with it. He does not fool with it. He means it. He keeps it. See, Moses had neglected the circumcision of his firstborn. He had been unfaithful to the covenant. So while on his way from the wilderness of Sinai to Egypt, Moses was met by a startling providence and came face to face with death. Let's now look at the mightiest conflict in history. You need to understand that this is the setup between God and Satan. Satan is persecuting God's 
covenant people. And when you touch in a covenant in a covenant relationship, when you touch one, you touch the other. That's why he said, Israel is my eye, the apple of my eye. Israel is my son. And you cannot, I will not permit you. And it was Satan working through Pharaoh to bring persecution and destruction to the children of Israel. And so this is the greatest conflict in human history because it pits God against Satan and Satan against God on behalf of God's covenant people. On one side is a read all the power and wealth and splendor of Egypt, its learning, its pride, and its confident dependence upon its gods. We shouldn't fail to mention the technology of Egypt. At that time, it was the mightiest nation in the earth. They had wisdom, they had learning, they were into medicine, they were into the sciences, they were into buildings. Till today, if you look at the, um, the pyramids, say, wow, if they could easily be duplicated, it would have been done many times over. It's those massive structures without the equipment we have today. Today you use bulldozers and cranes, but they didn't have them. How were they able to do it? And so Egypt was the most advanced nation and they had all these gods that they thought controlled the universe. On the other hand, if you look at Moses, a poor, weak, aged, broken, and discredited man. Remember, he was um, an ex-convict. He was a murderer. He was somebody who had lost his reputation and he had but only one follower, his brother Aaron. So two slaves demanding liberty not for themselves but for three million people, demanding again and again. And I could just imagine two decrepit people coming uh, before this mighty king and demanding the freedom of three million people. I believe that initially they scorned them, they laughed at them, but sooner or later they were not laughing anymore. They realized that the faith of Pharaoh and the faith of Egypt were in the hands of this man. The good thing is, even though Pharaoh was def defiant, it didn't break their spirit, they didn't say, Lord, he has refused, so we won't go back again. Every time the Lord sent them, they went back again and again and again and again. So these two blood covenant men hold the fate of Egypt in their hands and leave written upon the land words which lived when his greatness had passed away. Still we refer to that story the most wonderful 
one of the most incredible stories of all time. Let's look at some facts concerning Egyptian kings. In the minds of the Egyptians, Pharaoh was equally man and God. And so, Pharaoh was man and also divine. And if he says live, you live. If he says die, you die. When Pharaoh speaks, that's the end of the matter. Whether it's a miscarry of justice or not, nobody could challenge, nobody could appeal. He had ultimate power. And so they revered him, they worshipped him. And um, he was addressed as divinity. He occupied two different platforms. He sits apart alone. And he didn't have any equal. When he has spoken, the matter is judged. We now understand why Pharaoh stands forth as the man, as the one man in all Egypt with whom the deliverer of the Israelites has a controversy. So it wasn't, you need to understand this point clearly. The deliverer of Israel had a controversy with Pharaoh because Pharaoh represented the powers of darkness, the work of Satan, the oppressor. Satan was using Pharaoh and his men to afflict and to destroy God's people, God's covenant people. So he was the one God had a controversy with. If you look at Exodus 8, 10, 22, and 23. So he said, tomorrow, and he said, let it be according to your word, that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. And in that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there, in order that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the land. I will make a difference between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign shall be. So God and his people are on one side. Pharaoh and his people are on the other side. On Pharaoh's side of Satan. On God's covenant people side was God himself. It is the contest between the true and the living God and the pretender. God has to break the idol to pieces and lay the idol low to deliver his people. And as we conclude, I want you to reflect on what's happening. Satan is hard at work oppressing God's people. But God is a covenant-making and a covenant-keeping God. And because of that, he keeps his word. And he fights for you. If you are a covenant person, know that God will not allow the enemy to continue to molest you. He will not allow the enemy to destroy you. He will not allow sickness to destroy you. You need to rise up in faith. Talk to him. Talk to him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name.
Hallelujah. Now, before the offering, uh, ladies, Mama Rosa, yeah, Mama Rosa have a message for you. Remember your picnic. What time? Spoken concerning you, it will come to pass. Uh, the promise he has spoken to you, yes, he will bring it to pass in the name of Jesus. Uh, you can bless him. Mama Maribaboa. Yandorobo, you are not forgotten. Uh, in the name of Jesus. Yandu. He ramama le brake yandiri bi sikata kila mandiri bi sikiti yandiri bi sikiria malibi bi yanda la basa kariba bo kamandiri bi sakariba kateri bi yanda God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob you are faithful you are faithful O Lord abakuri basanda le bakundiri bi sik even after four hundred and thirty years malibro kabasa ya you do not forget your word. Uh, tonight we give you thanks in the name of Jesus. Uh, for you all along have been ordering our steps. Oh Lord, we give you thanks. Uh, you have been ordering our steps. Uh, bringing about uh, uh, the fulfillment of that what you have spoken concerning us. Uh, we praise you, we praise you, we praise you. Imarababa. Uh, for who else is like unto thee uh, among the gods, O Jehovah? Somebody declare, uh, place your faith in God. Uh, rest assured in this Jehovah God. Libaka yandurubu sikiteri andili besanda ilama mandiri bi yandurubu sakataria ilabake ramandiri bi Father we give you praise we worship you most high God we thank you tonight uh, Jehovah as we hear and study your word uh, Father we see you at work all uh, oh, causing all things to work together for your people on account of the promise that you have spoken uh, for you are a covenant making and covenant keeping God uh, we give you thanks uh, in the name of Jesus uh, amen amen Amen. Let's put our hands together for Jesus. Oh, what a word. What a word. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to Jesus. This God can be trusted. Amen. Oh, he can be trusted. He can be depended upon. Hallelujah. He is a solid rock on which we stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, glory to Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let me take a couple of couple of um, feedback. What did you learn? Two, maybe just two. What did you learn? Anybody? Shout it out. Yes. Go ahead. What did you retain? Anybody? Yes, Amen. Go ahead. Yes. 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 Amen. Amen. Beautiful, beautiful summer. Yes. 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 Amen. 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 His plan is still on. Amen. Because when we look, yes, we look at circumstances sometimes. If you don't take care, you may say, is God still, right? Has he forgotten me and stuff? But 
Even though, right, I mean, that's beautiful. Satan is at work. But, yeah, God is still in control. Anyone else? One more person. Yes, go ahead, Sister Wendy. Idolatry, yes. Yes, yes, amen, right? And, and some of us here, right? Some of us here, we come from families where witchcraft is practiced, right? Idolatry and all that. But God pulled you out of that environment. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Amen. Offering time, blessing time. And this same God, he said, none shall appear before me empty. And as we give him, we give to him in obedience to his word. He's just looking for, our, for an excuse to bless us even more. Anyone would like an envelope? Just raise your hand. Otherwise, we use the e-transfer. Oh, what a night. Thank you, Jesus. Please talk to God with your offering. Father, we give you praise. Kabandu rebe sike rebe kainde rebe sakatari abrandu riba saia. La mama de rebe riande lebe. What a privilege you have bestowed upon us, O Lord, that we who once were not a people, Father, coming from places that could not even be found on the maps, but yet you thought of us. You knew us all along. We were not a second thought, not an afterthought. You had us in mind. You ordered our steps. You came after us. You rescued us. You made us your own. You reconciled us with you. And so, Lord, today we give you thanks. We gladly bring to you the portion that belongs to you. Bless your children. Pour your abundance into their lives. And we give you the praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome God. Mighty God. Awesome God, Almighty oh God, oh, we give you praise. Awesome God, awesome God, we give you praise. We give you praise, Almighty oh God. God. For you are highly lifted up, awesome God. You are highly lifted up, mighty God. Awesome God, we bless you once again. We say thank you for the opportunity to come into your house, to come to Mount Zion, the mountain of God, where we go from strength to strength. For each time we come, Father, grace is imparted in us. We thank you for that what you have imparted tonight. We know indeed we are not returning the same. We give you praise. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Jehovah God lift up his countenance 
upon you. May he give you peace. May the Lord cause his promise of double portion to be fulfilled in your life in 2024. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you Friday night, 9 p.m. right here.